The Strutt Family Albums. This is the first of two presentations about one element of the Strutt Family. It was Jedediah Strutt who, with his business partner Samuel Need, financed Richard Arkwright's first water-powered cotton mill at Cromford and went on to create his own cotton mills at Belper and Milford in the years that followed. But for these talks, we'll be concentrating on this man, George Herbert Strutt, great-great-grandson of Jedediah, and his family and their lives as recorded in albums of family photographs. Not all have survived, but acquisitions in recent years have helped piece together something of how they lived. George Herbert, or Herbert as his family called him, was from the first generation whose lives could be recorded in photographs from an early age. Here he is, aged eight in 1862, from the earliest surviving album, which we'll look at first. This first album does include earlier generations. This was his father, George Henry Strutt, in the same year, aged 36. George Henry joined the family firm at the age of 21 and during his time the mill chimney was built and the mill fire brigade improved and modernised. A lover of classical literature and poetry, he was also a keen cricketer, eventually giving his private ground to the newly created Belper Meadows Cricket Club. In later life, he funded an extension to the Derbyshire Royal Infirmary and provided funding for Belper's waterworks. He and Herbert would sometimes teach the boys at the Long Row schools. George Henry married Agnes Ann Ashton in 1846, the day after his 20th birthday. This is Agnes, again in 1862, in the conservatory of Bridge Hill House, where the family relocated from Milford House in 1858. Anne was an adept seamstress and passed on her skills not only to her daughters, but also to the children at the Long Row schools. She created the cottage hospital at Bridgefoot, from where food was made available to those unable to support themselves. This was extended to create a communal kitchen during the Crimean War, when the town faced food shortages. Each year, on St Thomas's Day, December the 21st, she and oldest daughter Susan distributed to tenants and widows suitable clothing and bedding, the recipients visiting the cottage hospital to collect the gifts. On Christmas Eve, they were known to visit the schools at Long Row to provide new clothing for the children. This is Susan, George Henry and Agnes's eldest daughter, who supported her mother's charity work and was well known in Belper for her work with the poor in the town. She never married and died in 1894, aged just 47. Second daughter was Lucy, seen here aged 13 in 1863. She married and moved away to her husband's family estates near Carlisle. There was one other child, the youngest, Clara. She died of croup in 1862 when she was just two. This faded photograph from the album is the only known image of her. There's one other strut in those early albums, and from a generation before even George Henry. This is Anthony Radford Strutt, aged 74 in 1865. He was George Henry's uncle, but also a grandson of the first Jedediah Strutt. He bought and virtually replaced a farmhouse at Makeney to create what we today call Makeney Hall, and after his death the house was home to Herbert for over 40 years. Here's Herbert at Harrow, aged 18 in 1872. He enjoyed Harrow greatly, but was always quite shy and unassuming. Here he is two years later, in 1874, during his time at Oxford University. Two years later, on the day after his 22nd birthday, he married. This is Edith Adela Bulgy, Herbert's first wife. She too was from a local Derbyshire family, and they were very happily married. She and Herbert had seven children, five girls and two boys. The eldest boy was George Ashton Strutt, seen here in his mother's arms when he was just a month old. Here is George Ashton in about 1887, with eldest sister Adela and third child Isabel. This later photograph was taken in Scarborough, where the Strutt children took holidays for a time. After an eight-year break, Edith then had three daughters over four years, first Daisy in 1889, then Agnes, then Lucy. Their last child was Anthony Herbert Strutt, seen here aged six months. 
Sadly, his mother Edith died when he was just two years old. She was just 41. The family home, as I have said, was at Makeney. Known as Makeney House at the time, it's now better known as Makeney Hall. This photograph was taken shortly after the building was extensively enlarged, perhaps to accommodate a rapidly growing family around 1896. The entire wing to the right, including the Copper Dome Tower, were a new addition. George Henry Strutt continued to live at Bridgehill House until he died in 1895. Agnes outlived him by five years, but after her death in 1900, no family members lived there. It seems to have been used chiefly at weekends when the family would come over from Makeney to enjoy the gardens. Herbert made no signs of moving to live at Bridge Hill, perhaps partly because of the considerable investment he'd made in enlarging the Makeney house. The larger house still had its uses. It was ideal for special occasions such as family weddings. Daisy Strutt's wedding reception was held at Bridge Hill House in April 1911 and family members are seen here in the reception hall. In 1898, Herbert decided to marry again. His new wife was Mary Emily Charlotte Hind, known as Emily. It was Emily who enjoyed photography and took the photographs which appear in the other albums, the earliest covering 1908 and 1909. By then, Emily had given birth to a son, Henry, who died very young, and three daughters, Emily in 1902, known as Babby or Babs, Rose Mary in 1905, known as Mary and later as Mardi, and Charlotte in 1906. So let's make a start on Emily's albums. The first covers 1908 and 1909, as I said, and this is one of the earliest photographs. Tea on the lawn at Bridge Hill House for the three sisters, accompanied by one of their half-sisters, Daisy, we think, in the fine hat, and two of the nursery staff. Here they are again at Bridge Hill. From left to right, Mardi, Charlotte and Babby, on a Sunday visit from Makeney in July 1908. They're each wearing sun hats with the name of the family sailing yacht Sander written across the ribbons. Babby has her own watering can for their walk around the gardens. A fortnight later, they are back and standing in front of the shutters and curved wall of the Bridge Hill Library. On Sunday the 2nd of August, they returned but there must have been something of a family reunion, as their three older half-sisters, Agnes, Lucy and Daisy, are with them. On the same day, Agnes is seen here giving Mary a push in a rather fine-looking wicker pushchair in front of the Bridge Hill Conservatory. A few days later, they're joined by Babby and Charlotte, as well as their father Herbert, who is making sure they stay standing on the conservatory window ledge and don't fall off. The same day, they were joined by Anthony, Herbert's second son, presumably on his summer break from Harrow. Anthony is rarely seen smiling, so was perhaps a sombre boy. He seems to have a strong bond with his father, perhaps because he was only two years old when his mother died. Less than a decade after this photograph was taken, he died from his wounds in the final year of World War I, and his father was deeply affected. Later in August 1908, and Babby and Mardi are exploring the grounds at Bridge Hill with older sisters Lucy and Agnes, making their way along the outer wall of the fruit garden. While Babby and Mardi take a little break on the wall of the promenade, let's take a little look around the grounds. Here's the path past the herbaceous borders and down the side of the fruit garden to the peach house. You can just see the roof of the peach house behind the wall on the right. And here's the stile that took you past the vinery on the right to the yard at the rear where the potting shed stood. You can just see the back wall of the potting shed roof behind the vinery. This, we believe, is the main avenue up to the peach house, the biggest of several glass houses in the grounds. And at the rear of the grounds stood this little thatched summer house and the fine gates and gateposts. This was the team of gardeners needed to keep the grounds in good order, led by Mr Howie head gardener in the foreground. He came from a large Scottish estate to work for Herbert's father, George Henry Strutt, in the 1880s. This view of the house shows the steepness of Bridge Hill and how a series of terraces were needed to accommodate the house and the many different elements of the gardens. Moving in closer, 
we can see the formal ornamental garden designed by Howie many years earlier for George Henry, which was laid out in front of the conservatory and library. Right, back to Mardi, Charlotte and Babby, still in August 1908 and standing between the conservatory and that ornamental garden. The gardens seem to have been something of a playground for them and they have their little spades out for playing with the gravel in the paths. Here are the older sisters in their fine Sunday clothes, again outside the library, with the conservatory doors on the left. This would have been their view of the three younger girls with spades and buckets and with sailor suits for the two youngest. A wider view again shows how steep the slopes were as you moved away from the house. The little marquee beyond the garden perhaps provided a little shade for the serving of their teas. We have to remember that the photographer, as far as we are aware, was the girl's mother Emily, and just two weeks later another photograph is taken of the girl's newly arrived brother Arthur, seen here at just three days old. It is perhaps understandable then that Emily took a break from photography for six months and the album picks up again in March 1909, with Herbert holding Arthur at Makeney Hall, with Anthony once more returned from Harrow, standing at his side. This is a rather lovely shot of Herbert and his third son the following month, again at Makeney. Easter Sunday was a sunny one in 1909, and Babby, Mardi and Charlotte have baskets ready for an egg hunt as they sit with their father and Anthony in the Makeney Gardens. Makeney House provided a fine backdrop for their Easter game. A month later, in matching outfits, they are using wicker push chairs for taking their favourite toys on a tour of Makeney grounds. Emily chose to take a photograph of the house that day as well, noting the tulips in full flower in the foreground. The 7th of May 1909 was something of a red letter day. The official opening of the Herbert Strutt School by the Duke of Devonshire. Herbert had fully funded the school, which he had designed by architects Hunter and Woodhouse. Early that morning, Emily photographed one of their daughters, probably Babby, running across Derby Road to inspect the garlands that had been put up outside the school for the big event. Needless to say, the A6 was a much quieter road in those days. Here's another view looking towards Belper. There was even bunting crossing the road. The man on horseback hints at the level of traffic in those days. After the opening ceremony, guests moved down to the River Gardens, another gift from Herbert to the town for afternoon teas. This is the only known photograph of Herbert in the River Gardens and he's joined by James Oakes, the chairman of Derbyshire's Education Committee, a close friend who frequently came to stay with Herbert and his family during their Scottish holidays, more of which later. It's a shame there's damage to this photograph taken four days later on the lawn at Makeney. It's another outdoor tea for the girls, but now joined by Arthur at the rear in his pram. Later in May, it was time for the children's holidays to begin, the first being a trip to Rill, where the family were considering having a seaside home. Now they had four small children to consider, and substantial money available since the sale of the mills to the English Sewing Cotton Company a few years previously. Emily and the children initially seemed to have stayed here on St Asaph Street before it was agreed that a rather fine house called Glen Sander, after an area of their Scottish estates, was built nearby on Russell Road. Talking of their Scottish estates, this is where we will be spending the remaining pages of the album, at King Gairlock. Herbert and Emily bought the estate in May 1902 as a getaway from all of Herbert's duties in Derbyshire during the summer months of July and August. The tower was newly built, had building defects and was soon removed, but this was the house that the family loved and held on to remaining Arthur's home after the other strut houses were sold off, only being sold in 1989, and even then Arthur's widow Patricia stayed on as manager until her death in 2001. The family's love of Scotland predates King Gairlock. Before 1902, they had leased Ardkinglas House each summer since 1883. This house had originally been the stables, converted around 1830 after the main house burnt down. 
When the owner decided to rebuild, the opportunity for staying at Ardkinglas came to an end and Herbert began the search for a Scottish retreat the family could truly call their own. It was perhaps having a circular bench outside Ardkinglas that encouraged Herbert to have his own built when King Gaelock was bought. Here you can see Mardy, Babby, Arthur and Charlotte on the King Gaelock circular bench, which proved to be an ideal point for photographs during the family's summer breaks. There's a footman trying to make a quick exit on the left. The house was well staffed. Here they are on arrival the previous month, kitted out for the cooler Scottish weather and accompanied by Arthur's nurse. The same nurse watches in the background here as Herbert holds Arthur up by the front door. One of their great pursuits at King Gaelock was deer hunting and there were 22,000 deer estimated to be living on the peninsula. But here it looks as if the children have come to see the men off as they go grouse hunting. It's August now and they've been joined by Lucy and Anthony from Herbert's first marriage. A rare image of Anthony smiling, perhaps because he's on his long summer break from Harrow. This was the view from the house, looking down towards the bay, which provided the best route in and off the estate. If you'll remember the hats worn by the girls back at Belper, Herbert had bought a steam yacht called Sander, which brought the family in from Oban, where they transferred from the train. Here are two members of the crew. The girls were back in sailor suits and accompanied by Arthur and his nurse for this photograph on Sander in August 1909. More family members and friends had joined them as August drew to a close and gathered for a group photograph on the circular bench. Anthony, at top, seems to be truly enjoying the occasion. Herbert's trying to keep Arthur occupied with a soft toy on this photograph from the same weekend. A chance to admire the view for the men in the group with telescopes set out on the front lawn. And perhaps this was one of the last walks in the grounds for the three girls and their parents before they prepared for the journey back to Belper and a more public life. The last two photographs are stuck in the back of the album, perhaps because Emily didn't want to start a new album with just two photographs from their summer stay at King Gaelock. They are both from a gathering in the woods around a smoky fire. Judging from the fly swatters and covering up of necks, the Scottish midges were a challenge, but the sense of enjoyment at the gathering around the fire is clear. A pleasant reminder for Emily at the very end of her album. Next time, we'll take a look at the later albums, particularly those which feature the final addition to Herbert and Emily's family, Little Bridget. Until then, thank you for watching. <laughs>